female mm. sexuality mm. is narcissistic. Mm. She has to like herself. So I ask women but in my office many times, would you make love to yourself? Because if you don't think you want to make love to yourself, you won't connect with the person who wants to make love to you. You will perform right. to keep them coming, but you won't have a fulfilling experience. You're listening to Sex with Emily. I'm Dr. Emily, and I'm here to help you prioritize your pleasure and liberate the conversation around sex. I have the immense honor of having renowned psychotherapist and two-time best-selling author Esther Perel on the show today to discuss all things sex and relationships, from cultivating eroticism in long-term relationships, particularly when we're all immersed in our phones, to the rise in non-monogamous relationship structures. This is an episode you absolutely do not want to miss. Please rate and review Sex with Emily wherever you listen to the show, my new articles, Seven Signs of Sexual Compatibility, and Oral Herpes, How to Keep Living Your Best Sex Life, are up on sexwithemily.com. All right, everyone, enjoy this episode. By now, you've probably heard my magic wand story. It's a brand that's been part of my personal journey for more than 20 years. But no matter how many times I sing Magic Wand's praises, I'll never be able to fully capture the story of this incredible brand. Well, now journalist and author Kate Sloan just completed a limited audio series documenting the history and impact that Magic Wand has created over the last 56 years. It's called Making Magic. And the series chronicles Magic Wand's incredible brand story through interviews with nearly 40 experts, performers, business owners, educators, and fans. So I got a sneak preview of the series. And what I loved is that Kate weaves together snippets from all their interviews into this amazing story arc. She covers Magic Wand's journey from a appliance store massager to its legendary influence on culture and sexual independence. And it's all just fascinating. The first episodes of Making Magic are available now at makingmagicseries.com or on all popular podcast platforms. Just search for Making Magic or visit makingmagicseries.com today. Psychotherapist Esther Perel is one of the most fascinating contemporary voices on sex, relationships, and human connection. Author of the iconic bestsellers, Mating Captivity and State of Affairs, she's also the host of the Where Should We Begin podcast, which allows listeners to drop in on real-life counseling sessions between Esther and her clients. Her popular card set, Where Should We Begin, was inspired by her work as a psychotherapist, and her celebrated TED Talks have garnered more than 20 million views. It is my huge honor to welcome Esther Perel back to the show today. It's a pleasure. (laughs) So good to see you. It's good to see you too. I want to jump right in because we've got a lot to cover here, Esther. I think that most couples will benefit from therapy and yet you'd think I was asking them to get like a colonoscopy or something. It still is like a very painful thing for them. They just don't get it. So what I appreciate so much about your podcast, Where Should We Begin, is that we get to eavesdrop on real life therapy sessions as you guide them. And then you encourage people to say the things that they think they cannot say and have healthy conversations, maybe even for the first time under your guidance, which is such an incredible thing to listen to. I think I was listening to a recent one. Someone said, we've been together 20 years and we've never had this kind of honesty that they have in that one hour. So for people who have not yet listened to your podcast, what are some examples of healthy communication? And what are most of us doing wrong? What don't we get? I think sometimes what we do wrong is that we don't see what we do right. Mm. (laughs) We should include that too. Um, That when couples are in a situation of distress or negative sentiment override with more criticism than appreciation and more attacks than gratitude, so to speak, is that they actually do not see the good things that do exist between them because they're having a distortion of perception in which they emphasize and highlight only what's missing or what's negative with a confirmation bias. They're only looking for evidence for what reinforces their belief. But you see, an interesting thing is that even couples who have been or are going to see a couples therapist, when they listen to the podcast, they experience something that couples often lack, which is the intimate knowledge of what's happening in the neighbor's house. 
couples are often very isolated. They have to pretend that things go well. They don't tell the truth. Sometimes the women talk to their girlfriends. Often the men talk to nobody. That's in a straight context. If you put two men together, you get a, a different experience of silence. And so I think that the actual experience of listening deeply to others allows you to see yourself and allows you to normalize yourself so that it's not what are we doing wrong, but in fact, how is this normal for being in a relationship? <laughs> mm-hmm. And what we can do better for sure. How can we communicate differently? How do we establish a different type of intimacy? How do we allow for difference in the relationship, for disagreement in the relationship? How do we continue to change it and grow because we are married twice as long as we were 100 years ago? And so it's not like we stay on a standstill. And all of that, I think, is part of the experience of Basically, you recreate the village when you listen to a podcast, right? In the old village, the streets were very narrow. We were just talking about having been to Greece. You have these narrow streets. Everybody knows what's happening in the neighbor's house. You know, every fight and every frolic. But when you live in the urban environments of which so many of us live today, you actually often sit there saying, am I the only one? And the podcast brings back the village. That's the intent, actually. Those are not patients. They have never been, nor will they ever be my patients. There are about 6,000 applicants for the new season. So it's people who want to have that experience, that quality of attention, of communication, and of listening. Mm. It's listening, which is such an important skill set that doesn't come naturally. I think people don't realize like we actually need to work on it. And so I guess what you're saying, listening to the podcast, you really kind of get how we could do it better. And maybe we feel better that everyone else is suffering in some way. And we, right? <laughs> there is a sense <laughs> of communality for sure. But also, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is we, we listen quite well when people say nice things. The challenge is how to listen to somebody who says something that hurts us or annoys us or that we disagree with. And The research tells you that we have a capacity to listen for 10 seconds when somebody tells us something that we don't agree with. 10 seconds, that's three sentences. And if you ask people to repeat what was just said, many are incapable of doing so because they're busy paraphrasing, editing, you know, building the response. (laughs) So listening is really challenging in, in many of the situations in relationships. Yeah. So do couples ever come in and you think to yourself, this isn't going to work? Like maybe it's, you know, mismatched political views or their hobbies or someone's an introvert, someone's an extrovert. In other words, like, are there things that we can work on and which issues can't typically be resolved, if any? None of the ones you mentioned are unresolvable. It's a little bit like the princess and the pea. In some couples, the pea is enough to create an explosion. The slightest difference is experienced as enormous. And in other couples, major differences. A friend of mine was mentioning yesterday how her parents never voted for the same party in 56 years of marriage. And, you know, they joked that they each were canceling each other's votes out. And uh, and that was that. They fundamentally disagreed. So it's not the issue. In relationships, the context is more important than the content. The process, the form is more important than the issue. If you talk to somebody with an element of contempt, if you talk to somebody where you look down on them, if you talk to somebody in constantly correcting them, whatever it is you do, it doesn't matter what the subject will be. If you talk to somebody who you think doesn't care about you and you've decided that up front, you'll hear everything through that lens. And you will notice that you can be talking about Greenpeace in South Korea or childcare or your sex life, and it all sounds exactly the same. I do an exercise in the sessions that I borrow from my dear friend, Hedy Schleifer, where I make people have an argument for X amount of minutes. She does it 13 minutes, this is to tell you. 13 minutes they argue, even if they don't feel like arguing, they have to keep it up. And then, I don't do the 13, I do it shorter, but the idea is then I say to them, imagine this couple that just had this fight, they're sitting next to you in the restaurant and you've actually, you don't understand their language. Now tell me what you see. 
And this takes you away from the issue. You see, you see one person leaning in, another person rolling their eyes, another person turning their shoulder, another person pounding their fist, another person squeezing their lips. And you see the fight without the issue. And then you see what people do to each other rather than what they're talking about. So it's more like you can see, you can feel the contempt even by watching, or you can feel the disrespect. Yes, it's a dance. It's, 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 it's a choreography. It's a total dance. The, the contempt or the sadness or the hurt or the not being listened to or the trying to say it again with the hopes that maybe this time I'll get true to you, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like a drill. If you respect for your partner the fact that they vote differently from you or that they have never liked the music you listen to or that they don't believe in the same God as you, it doesn't mean there is not a sense of loss, but it doesn't have to become a point of contention or of the demise of the relationship. So when people come, if you ask me, are there times when I say this isn't going to work? Yes. When one person comes in to drop off the other person and basically says, you know, I'm out of here, take care of them. Then you know that there is not much to do. That You need two people, at least if it's a relationship of two, maybe it's three or four. When you feel like they're dead upon arrival, they're coming to just say that they did therapy, but in fact, they can't wait to go to the lawyers and start destroying each other. You know, then you know that you just, something that they need to put on the resume of divorce. That's not a good situation. When there's been egregious, egregious, repeated betrayals, with somebody who has zero remorse, then you think mm, this may not be really a, a, a right. situation here. So there are very clear situations, but they're not about issues. They're about the quality or the lack of thereof of the relationship. Huh. I suppose in some cases you say they come in and they say, fix my partner. And then there's some people who say, okay, I guess I'm here. I do need to b- do the work. But it's the people who think it's only my partner. There's nothing wrong with me that we can't really fix. So that actually, that situation is very common. Many people come to therapy to tell you how expert they are on their partner and what's wrong with them, and they'll help you fix them. They'll be very collaborative with you. That's not the end of the relationship. The end of the relationship is when there is one person who is implicitly or explicitly gone. They've already They left pretend the they're there, but they've left. Okay. You know, some relationships are finished long before they officially finish. Mm. The other question I I get asked a lot, and I wanted to get your take on this, is people often say to me, I'm sure they say this to you all the time, can we get the attraction back? Can we get the sex life back? But here's the caveat, if they never had it in the beginning. Mm. How do you answer it? I'm curious. Esther, this is what I say, and I've been dying to ask you this question. I say Mm -hmm. it's really challenging If you never had it in the beginning, like there was no spark, there was nothing, it was maybe more of a marriage of convenience, or you kind of always resented your partner, the sex was never great, that it is really challenging to like rub sticks together and make the spark come if you never had it in the beginning. But I'm curious, I'm so curious what you would say about that. Hmm. Um, It's one of the things I sometimes think, but I've seen so many variations on the situation, right? So I start from the premise that our emotional needs are not always aligned with our sexual needs. What makes us feel good emotionally is not necessarily what excites us sexually. So it's not about the convenience. It's that you chose someone who answered one set of wishes and needs, but not another. You did choose right, but you chose somebody, you know, who you knew was steady who wouldn't abandon you, who wouldn't cheat on you, who you, who knew would encourage you to blossom. There's a lot of beautiful emotional reasons for choosing someone, and you have to honor that. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the question becomes, it's not just a matter of chemistry. I think that I have seen many people who didn't have it from the beginning because that's in their head. They said, that's not why I choose you. Mm-hmm. I choose you for other reasons. For example, If I think of you as the steady person who you're not the erotic type, as in you're not the one I have to worry about, you don't look around, you wonder if it's true or you wonder to what extent I do this because when I clip your wings in my imagination, in my head, I make you safe for me and I de-eroticize you in the interest of other needs that have to do with secure attachment and stability, etc. 
You see, it's not just, oh, we didn't have the spark. I think that, that it's not the way it works. I've worked with enough people who are queer people in multiple relationships, and they find the source of their sexual interest in multiple places. It doesn't come just from sheer excitement and attraction. It sometimes comes from the depth of the connection, the curiosity, a diff, you know, so... It's an important part is to say, why, what is your investment in this relationship not being so sexual? Now, are there people with whom you play better music than others? Absolutely. You can improvise with this one. You can never play with that one. And so then the question is, maybe you won't have that kind of sex. Maybe you won't play that kind of music. Maybe this is music where you each take turns. <laughs> this is music that has a different intensity. No, this is not the music where you stay till four o'clock in the morning, you know, each jiving on the other. But there are different types of music to play. Are you interested in playing other music or is your only interest the best music you've ever played? If the only sex that is good is that unbridled sex that was uncomplicated, easy, you know, groove from moment one then you're not going to find that here but huh. are you curious about finding another type of sexuality here no it won't be as good as the other but that doesn't mean that it has to be none what you're saying is if both people are like we really want to find it we want to find a way to connect and they get to sort of do some exploring together and figure out what kind of music works with them they can both sing too. Yeah. I mean, compatibility exists. Huh? It, it, some couples yeah. are definitely more compatible than others in multiple areas. With one, you can sleep very well and have great sex, but not talk. We have different levels of compatibility. The question is, what do you do with your disappointment? We will never have this is such a defeating statement that nothing can come from there, you know. And But I have also seen people who had zero of that connection and then the partner goes and has an affair and suddenly they have a voracious hunger mm -hmm. you know this thing called lack of desire or lack of sexual interest or desexualizing the other plays itself in many different has many different facets so i've seen people who were for years uninterested in their partner until someone else became interested in their partner Classic. And then suddenly their partner was no longer the flannel nightgown. They became the nice silk. <laughs> we don't respect them or we don't, we lose interest and then we can't have them. And then it becomes that spark, right? That friction that you often talk about, right? That or, or we take, or we relate to them like family members. Mm -hmm. One of the primary reasons people desexualize their partners is because they become family and they treat their partners like family in the good sense of the word. But some people, experience family in such a way that the sex starts to feel incestuous. Mm. It's like, I'm with my brother. I'm with my sister. I'm with my best friend. They tell it to you, you know? I feel like I'm with my, it's like a, like a parent. I feel like I'm with a child. No, you don't want to have sex with a child if your head is screwed right. right. So the, the familialization, it's not familiarization, but familialization of your partner is often a major deterrent to being able to sexualize yourself with them or sexualize them in your eyes more than many others. Uh, Sarah, I think that that is so relatable. And I think that that is absolutely the case that we feel we become so close. I mean, this is your, your seminal work in Mating in Captivity, which just that notion that we're all walking around feeling that this person is so familiar. I used to have this spark at the beginning, but now literally I've seen them do everything. Or I've heard from friends, you know, he watched me give birth to three children came out of my vagina. Now how am I supposed to want to have sex with them? And so this family familiarity is so relatable and relevant. And that's But what sometimes it's the woman herself, right? Who says, I feel mother. In mm -hmm. this house, I feel mother. And from the place of mother, I have a hard time accessing my erotic energy. And so sometimes people find it much easier to leave and go and be elsewhere outside of the frame. It's not just the others are family. It's also in my role as this person, especially for women and motherhood, yeah. it's often more difficult to access right. the sexual self inside. This conversation was just fascinating, and I hope you're all enjoying it as much as I did. When we're back from a quick break for our sponsors, we're going to play a clip from Esther's podcast in which a married woman was able to learn to enjoy sex again and get the spark back.
Well, I want to play a clip from your podcast right now that actually segues right into what we're talking about. Okay. Um, We're going to play this clip from your podcast, Where Should We Begin? This clip is from the episode, You Want Me to Watch the Kids While You Go Out with Another Guy, which has the following backstory. This is a good one. They met as religious teenagers, married as virgins. It's the age-old story. Once you're allowed to be intimate, you no longer want to be. Deciding to open the marriage has brought about huge changes in their sex life and ruptures in their emotional one. And in this particular relationship, the wife is the one who has started to see other people, which has allowed her to then reclaim her sexuality from a marital obligation to a source of pleasure. So we're going to play the clip real quick. When we would talk about like, what the heck should sex be? Can you just tell me what it should be? Because if you ask me, I don't need it. I could go the rest of my life without it and it'd be fine. Um, so since, we, since we're here, we're married, we must have sex. What is sex to you? What is good sex to you? And he would always say the thing that you want guys to say, which is, I, wanted to, I, want, I want you to feel pleasure. I want to know that I can pleasure you. And it would stress me out so bad. Because like, I don't even know what that means. I have no idea what that means. I remember something he always wanted was to go down on me. And it was traumatizing. And now? Now I love it. <laughs> now I love it. He's a fantastic lover. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> Would you like me to shake your hand? <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, my God. He really is amazing. Yeah. And the same behaviors, the same touch that felt so violating yes. feels intensely pleasurable. Yes. That should tell you something. You know, to me, that is so powerful. Because in some interesting way, what it speaks to is that it is not about the sexual activity, behavior, touch itself. Since the same movements of him, the same touches of him Mm. that felt so violating is now such an intense source of pleasure. The sex is not the issue. Yeah. Yeah, the context the of the sex is the issue. So much to unpack here, but this is exactly what we're saying. Like now that she's kind of liberated, they've opened it up. You know, her partner's like same lips can feel different because she's been able to go out, explore her sexuality. The first thing I want to address though, I hear this all the time, Esther, from people, from friends, from listeners. I could go the rest of my life without sex and I'd be fine. I guess it's case by case basis, but do you ever think that's really true? And- how important is sex in relationships? This question, if we had time, it would be a, a, a treat to like really unpack it because even what you asked me before, right? What do you say to the people who have lost it? Mm-hmm. And you, you know, we often say there's only one beginning and it's the one beginning. Uh, so it's never the same afterwards versus the one who never had it. And of course, part of the people who never had it we have to find out if it's relational, if it's, to, I answered it in a relational way, who you choose. But I could also answer it from the perspective of one's own childhood and one's own sexual upbringing and one's experiences sexually or se- unwanted sex experiences that have made sex the last thing you look forward to, you know, so, so it's situations of violations and abuse, etc. So there's Many, many reasons why people find sex not an attractive proposition. Um, when somebody says, if I had no sex for the rest of my life, it can mean a lot of things. It can mean I'd rather go hiking than be touched. <laughs> why not? I, if the touch is unpleasant, if the touch evokes bad feelings for you, no, go hiking. I get it. Now, do you want to live this way? That's a different question. And it's for people to come and say, I something's missing for me or or something's missing for my partner. When I say this to my partner, my partner thinks I'm opening a casket. You know, this is a death sentence. Basically, we will never have this connection together. For some people, that's tremendous grief. You know, so people throw that sentence sometimes and it can be quite hostile. And sometimes they throw it in despair. So it, it, it's a very real sentence. You hear it a lot. It is true, but I also think it takes place in a context. Yes. The lack of, conne- of sexual connection to oneself 
or to another person. The loss of the spark or the desire is often a disconnect, an emotional disconnect from a person and a sexual or emotional disconnect from oneself. I mean, you can't separate these two. So now she says something else. You know, in her case, you see, she grows up in a very Christian environment. She, her, and she tells me at one point, my sexuality has belonged to the church. It has belonged to my Indian background. It has belonged to my family. And now it belongs to the institution of marriage. It has never been my own. And as a result, I have treated my sexuality as a a thing that I need to dispense of for the pleasures of others or for the rules and the restrictions of others. When I was in Catholic school, I was voracious. It was forbidden, and therefore I knew it. I wanted it. If I do something I'm not supposed to, then I know I'm doing something I want. <laughs> but the day I married the guy, and it became not only the thing I should want, but the thing I'm expected to do, I was once again in opposition, and I decided I want none of it. And what is it that she recovers? She recovers her sense of ownership, of autonomy. My sexuality belongs to me. And because of that, the same touch of this man, the same gestures become sources of pleasure rather than experiences where I grind my teeth just to get through it. It's very, very telling. She understands it. She sees that it's not even the fact that she went with others. In her case, it involved going with others. But it's the fact that she reclaimed something. It's really a reclamation. It's a, an experience of reclamation. And from that place, I give to you freely rather than you get. Oh, yeah, that's so powerful. So that the notion of her feeling like she could really take sex for herself and be present and enjoy her body and ask for what she wants with another lover, where when she's at home, it feels like a duty. In this case, she steps outside. And I want to get into non-monogamy in a minute. But the other thing in this clip... We hear many men like your client here in this podcast say, nothing turns me on more than to see her turned on, or I want to turn you on, or it gets me hot. And I've heard you say this, and I thought this was fascinating, but you rarely hear women say the same thing. Very rarely are women like, I just want to see my partner turned on. You know, I really want to see him turn on and then I get turned on. And what do you think this says about female sexuality? Because I think that's such an important note too for women. Like there's so much to unpack with that. (laughs) Um, You know, this is the conversation where we know we already want another conversation. (laughs) I know, Esther, there's a lot to talk about with you. (laughs) There's so much to unpack always. I I will share with you my observation. um, And you'll tell me what you think, because this is not something I can prove. But I noticed that in my office, indeed, in, in heterosexual couples, I would often hear, the men say, nothing turns me on than to see her turned on. If she's into it, you know, why? Because if she's into it, then I know that I'm not a predator. If she's into it, I'm not hurting her. And that face is what, it's the only thing that will tell it to me. You know, she can even pretend the whole thing and I wouldn't be sure. So knowing that she truly enjoys it, is liberating for the man Mm -hmm. from the predatory fear. It turns aggression into pleasure. It's extremely important. It is probably the most Mm. important uh, sexual block, you know, in the the psyche of many men. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, I thought, I never hear her say, nothing turns me on more than to see him turned on. It's actually irrelevant. Mm -hmm. If she's not into it, he can be standing there with the biggest erection possible. It will do absolutely nothing to her the shop is closed, you know, nobody at the reception. And so then I began to wonder, why is that? It's like, it's not what's happening to him that matters. It's what's happening to her. And a part of that is that that makes me think, what is the most important sexual block in the psyche of many women? It is the burden of caretaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I'm busy thinking about others and the well-being of others, I cannot enter into my own erotic universe, into my body, into my sensation, into my pleasure, into my orgasm for that matter. I can't even come. Mm -hmm. So it really said my social role is to think of others, but Mm. my sexual position is much more narcissistic. It has to be self-centered. Yes. If I'm busy thinking of him, 
then I'm not able to enjoy it nearly as much. I have to be able to think about myself. And these two configurations, I find, open up a whole other vista on the on what goes on in the sexual realm. It speaks to so much performative sex that we see women having. Yes. Because if he's yep. happy and he has an orgasm and he looks like he had a good time, well, then it must have been good sex. Check it off the list. I took care of someone else. And so what have you found mm-hmm. when you address this to couples? How do we get women to realize this, to recognize that you deserve the pleasure and that you got to take it for your own because it's such a, a mind switch. It takes work, right? Which is why I really use the word, a provocative word. Right? I said female sexuality is narcissistic. Mm. She has to like herself. So I ask women in my office many times, would you make love to yourself? Because if you don't think you want to make love to yourself, you won't connect with the person who wants to make love to you. You will perform right. to keep them coming, but you won't have a fulfilling experience. Mm. And it is about autonomy. Many times you will see a woman say, and I'm putting it on women in this instance, yeah. more because I've seen it more in a female frame. I think it could very well be in a non-binary frame, no less, mm-hmm. just to be clear. But a partner comes and initiates, and the first response is no. But 15 minutes later or an hour later, they initiate. And the partner thinks of it as a power maneuver. Why is it never, it's always on your term, it's never when I ask, etc. But once I understood that it wasn't an issue of power, but it was an issue of autonomy. Mm. When I come, when you're not asking, then I know that I want it. When I respond to your request, then I feel like I'm obliging, Mm. like I'm complying. And because for so many people, sexuality is so tenuous to own, to really feel like it's yours, it takes very little for another person to ask you something for you to instantly lose the ownership and feel that you're just trying to please them. That's how performative sex, how intense it is. And it is intense historically in the making of female sexuality more than men. This is what we've seen more for sure. So, so this notion of then we're actually then saying to women, like, we want you to learn to initiate, right? So we're saying that figure out how you can get into your own sexuality. So you have desire. I can just hear women saying, like, I don't know how to initiate. And I, like, it's such a, it's a, it's a leap for many. Like if you've had your whole life of performative sex, how do you sort of say, I'm going to let my eroticism boil up and then I'm going to make. So an exercise we do is I say, you take the hand of your partner male or female or them, you take the hand and you just stroke your neck, your head, your hair, your face. Forget genitals, don't because the performative is also often very genitally focused, very penetrative sex, very heterosex. Just let them stroke you. And I do an exercise that I think is actually one of the very revealing ones. It's very simple. I can do it in a big workshop and as, as I do it in an office. You, one person takes the hand of the other. And I basically say, play with this hand and just explore it. But at this moment, while you're exploring it, you want your focus to be entirely on your part. Do they like it? Do they know they have a knuckle here? Oh, I didn't never feel this before. And as you continue to play and explore the hand, I want you to go from giving touch to taking touch. I want you to use their hand to please you. And you see instantly the hand changing. Now I'm rubbing myself to, you know, like a cat yes. that is pleasing. And the switching back and forth between giving touch and taking touch, between pleasing you and pleasing me, between thinking of you and then just thinking of me in the presence of you is an incredible exercise to practice owning one's pleasure. Yes. That's a beautiful exercise of embodiment, attuning to what feels good to me and what feels good to you and the practice of asking for what you want. I loved starting with the hand exercise of rubbing your hands. It's hand. very hard for some people, by it's, the way. It just is so we... No, it is hard. This is not easy work, but it can be done, which, mm-hmm. you know, it's a practice. So more people are seeing ethical non-monogamy these days as a viable option for their relationships, or at least not that it's a new concept, but I'm wondering if you're seeing this as well, just more and more people asking about it, thinking, I think we're seeing more examples of it in media. People are being more open about it. You know, we used to always think the neighbors were not doing anything, but now the neighbors might actually be telling you we're, we're swinging, we're open. So 
like, what do you think about this? Like who's ethical non-monogamy right for, who isn't? Like what, what change are you seeing right now? So let me go back a tiny bit just so yes. that we don't have a sense that we had a monolithic model called monogamy <laughs> that has always meant the same thing. And suddenly comes this new notion of polyamory or consensual non-monogamy. Mm-hmm. You know, for most of history, monogamy was one person for life. And now monogamy is one person at a time. And people easily tell you, I am monogamous in all my relationships, plural. And they think that makes sense. And it's always been this way. For most of history, you married and you had sex for the first time. Then we married and we stopped having sex with others. Then we had contraception that allowed us to have other partners before. And now we want to be able to continue and have other partners during. And we want to have not just sexual partners, but also emotional partners. And it also comes as a response to the hardships of the nuclear family model, in which one person is supposed to give you what once an entire village used to provide. And so, in a way, the poly mentality is a communal mentality that says different people for different things Different people who care about the children too, for that matter, not just uh, in a in a in in a personal way. And I think it makes a lot of sense as creative attempts for some people to to develop new family arrangements, new family configurations. You know, when divorce started, especially when women began to divorce, the concept of a blended family was a whole revolution. Mm-hmm. You know, the concept of single families, the concept of... So we have had many new family models, but we haven't had many new couple models. Mm-hmm. And it is not for everyone, but what we do understand is there can't be a one-size-fits-all. Mm-hmm. People are now seeing that there's options, I guess, and that it, it could be possible. Well, that the only option isn't just to divorce and to start over. Right. That... The needs of a family may be different from the needs of a couple, may be different from the needs of an individual. That the monogamous model is one thing, a model. That it isn't natural or the laws of nature, or it is heavily the religious model, but it is a model that has favored certain people over others. Mm -hmm. And so um, there is a, a questing. It's part of a questing of what makes for modern connection. Mm -hmm. How do we create trust, loyalty, desire, family, you know, when we don't have the traditional institutions to support it? Um, So it's more entrepreneurial. It's more disruptive. It brings that whole energy. And it's more chaotic sometimes as well. Um, And it works for some people at some point in their life and not others. And then it is utterly not attractive to, you know. But I think that from a societal point of view, it's a, it's a rather understandable evolution. That makes sense. I mean, I, I kind of see this as an answer to like all the things from media and captivity that expecting one partner to be our everything. I am finding that people are more communal living and people are thinking, like, I know even with my friends, we're saying like, we should all just buy property and live near each other. You know, we're all different ages, different kinds of relationships and taking care of everyone's kids. Like, are you seeing that actually happening? I know there was a story recently yes. of these. Yeah, yes, yeah. there is a you quest see? of the, of the mothers the that were living the In China, yeah. There is a deep, deep, no, also in the States, there was an article yes. about mothers who came together during the pandemic, both houses together, are raising their children together. I think that we are, you know, especially in the United States, the level of individualism is so intense. Everybody has to do everything on their own. Mm-hmm. So even having a co-op for p- parents who come together around childcare becomes, you know, pro- you know, progressive rather than sensical. Yeah. You know, some of these things are just responding to the realities of life. Families live totally, you know, fragmented all, all over the continent. Um, who is going to be your family? A family of choice, you know, who are the people that you can entrust your children to that will be there when you are sick, that can come and visit you at the hospital, even if they're not married to you, you know, but they are your family and maybe they're even better at than your, than your spouse, supposedly, <laughs> exactly. to be that person. So I think that we are in a, an era where we are redefining family 
yeah. um, all together, what makes a family. Um, and that is very enriching and very generative. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's an exciting paradigm and I love seeing that happen right now. I loved your recent South by Southwest talk, which people can find online. We can also link that. But you talk about the other AI and that's artificial intimacy. And you say we're having less sex because we're on our phones constantly, which is, I think we all know this. I'm guilty of this. I've been watching a show with my partner and scrolling. What do we do about this? Like, how can we, he- I know these are all big questions, but how can we heighten our intimacy in this age of technology? Now we could play your game, where should we begin? Which is literally sitting in my fireplace mantle and we whip out cards sometimes and play it. But what do we do? What's working right now? I, <laughs> I mean, addicted. the first thing is we recognize it. Right? Not everybody even recognizes it. And it's not just that we have less sex because we are in our phone. It's that we are experiencing a growing social atrophy. Mm. You know, with people who are losing the skills of relating to others and connecting and being in the friction and the and the messiness of proximity with other people. So maybe people are having plenty of sex with themselves. Maybe they're having with their robot. Maybe they're having it on porn. Maybe. So, you know, there's lots of ways to have sex than just with one's partner. But there is a loss of connection. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about that. There's, you know, be, whether it's parents and kids or whether it's people, adults with each other. So how do we counter it deliberately? The same way that when people say, how do we maintain sex between us? I always say it's not spontaneous. It's deliberate. It's premeditated. It's willful. It's a ritual. You write it down. You plan it. You make it. You, but it's not just happening like that, spur of the moment. On occasion, but much of the time, you have to want it. You have to will yourself. You know, do you always run to the gym? No. But do you ever regret when you went to it? Probably not either. Exactly. But you you made an appointment. You planned it. You got, you know, you you have your, your, your clothes, your stuff that goes with you that is part of that activity. And that is very uncomfortable to people to say committed sex is premeditated sex. So it's just no different in this instance. You want to use your phones? Use your phones and start flirting with each other. How about instead of scrolling, you just start suddenly saying, hey, you know, there's somebody very hot sitting next to me. Or, you know, would you like to have a chat with this woman who is on the other side of the couch? Or uh, could I invite you for a drink? And you, you start playing with your partner, like, which is probably what you're doing with other people anyway. Well, so right. <laughs> you have to, <laughs> it is about bringing that kind of playful, creative energy in the domestic but it is not that far off from what I said when I wrote mating. It's just one more hurdle of one more level of motivation that you need to muster. And hopefully it creates something that you say is, is pleasurable enough. I just posted, you know, 10 favorite erotic films and I just picked 10 and it's fantastic. Now, the fascinating thing was not so many comments. It wasn't the okay. biggest <laughs> It's how many people save the list in the tens of thousands that because are saving the list of erotic you films. See? So this is what they yes. could do tonight. They could literally go to your Instagram yes. and say like, oh, babe, let's watch this erotic movie that could be a twofer. It's entertaining and we might get aroused. Yes. <laughs> and it, and you can play trailers to each other and you can make a select. So now we have decided to make a second list because all the people that wrote to us told us of other movies I should have included. Do that with your partner. What would be your list? Don't even take mine. Don't even take mine. Take mine afterwards, mm-hmm. you know, or take mine as a as a subject for discussion. Would you put that on your list? Would you put that one on your list? And change the conversation right away. That brings erotic energy mm-hmm. into a relationship. From there, you'll do whatever you do. But you got to warm up to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's just whatever fodder we can give people. Like we've got our yes, no, maybe list. Like people need tools. They need something to help lead them often to this path to eroticism and getting turned on again. So if it's a sexy movie, it's, you know, listening to podcasts. Oh, this is the card game. I mean, the definitely. card game, which is such a Lots fun of thing. good sex questions. But somebody has to say, hey, I have a question for you. Or text it, since we're mm-hmm. sitting next to each other anyway, with the phones in hand. I'll <sighs> text you. Hey, I have a question. And then I just suddenly throw a card at my partner. Yeah. And 
it's not about being sexy. It's about saving the relationship mm-hmm. at this point before we become totally numb. What you just said, though, I'm just curious about the relational skills that we're losing. I think it's been happening for a while with our phones and social media, but I think just it's just good to hear this because I even feel that myself, I'm always an extrovert. I love people. I get my energy that way. Even doing this on Zoom, I used to say, I'm not doing anything unless I can meet the person in part. Like, this has been a struggle for me just connecting sometimes on the on the Zoom. And this is what our life is right now. And I do feel like I've even gotten more awkward. I never thought I was socially awkward. I've got issues, Esther, but it was never that. Take me to a room and I can talk to people. And now it's just gotten more and more uncomfortable. And I guess you're probably seeing that in your practice with couples as well. Just that's impacting our relationships, I guess, is what I'm saying, is that even more so we might be relying on our partners when we're not there's lots of ways to answer this, but I'll highlight two things. Number one is there's a massive virtualization of our lives. Pandemic only accelerated all of that. Number two, we are living in a type of assisted living. You know, we have every predictive technology from Netflix to Waze to Spotify to Tinder telling us what, where to go, what to eat, what to watch, what to listen to next. And we are less and less in in contact with our own choices, our own doubts, our own deliberations, our own preferences, so that we actually become less and less able to deal with uncertainty. And the minute something happens in our relationship that isn't as I expected, we react. We want ripple free, like an app. We want the smoothness and the polished aspect of app life in our relational life. And we are really struggling with the rough edges. Then you add to that the fact that we have become conflict averse. Because if you don't really have face to face with people and you don't rub next to them, you don't have to deal with difference, disagreement in the micro so that when the big things happen, you have practice, which is part of why we just created a course on conflict, on turning conflict into connection, just because I realized There is on a societal level a conflict avoidance, and then we just polarize. I can't talk to you. Okay, then I cut off. You know, I ghost you, but I don't care because I've never seen your face and I have no idea what I did to you, you know, because it was all in writing anyway. And I don't have to take responsibility for my actions and the impact that it has on other people. And only I think about is what other people do to me. So dealing with conflict is not just about learning to fight well, it's about relating better. And Those are aspects of artificial intimacy that I was highlighting in the talk, that we are losing the friction. Now, friction is important. And when you talk sex, you talk friction. You know, so it's it's not even just metaphorical. If you smooth all the things out, you create people who are anxious. And then you can talk about a mental health crisis. Uh. Uncertainty, ambivalence, ambiguity. They are intrinsic to relationships, as is conflict. And that's where I am focusing now. It's uh, because, you know, why would I have sex with you? I'm upset. I'm annoyed. You know, I'm disappointed. I resent. Those are all reasons of people to, to cut off sexually or intimately as well. I want nothing to do with you. Mm. That's so interesting. We do need this course, right? Maybe the the conflict could become foreplay, right? Couples can be like, we got a conflict, but now we can lead to connection. I love that. In a way for couples who are struggling to communicate, which is so many, they can learn how to to perhaps even eroticize it. Because as we know, we need that kind of friction to create the eroticism. So I love this, Esther. This course comes out soon, yeah? I think in October. October 10. Okay. Yeah. October 10. I love that, Esther. That is Mm -hmm. such a great course. And really timely. We need this ASAP. Why don't we just go into our quickie questions then, Esther? We've got five questions we asked all of our guests. First thing that comes to your mind. Ready? What's your biggest turn on? Oh, I'm a sapiosexual, you know. Um, My biggest turn on, I I don't have one. I can (laughs) totally melt with somebody who is playing the guitar and singing to me a beautiful ballad (laughs) as somebody who's reading a poem into my ears as uh, somebody who is um, touching me in a way that it feels really good. I I rarely have one answer for any of these questions. (laughs) Biggest turn off? (sighs) Smell. What makes good sex? Variety, playfulness, unexpected, Mm. surprise, um, being generous, Something you would tell your younger self about sex and relationships. 
don't ever do it if it hurts mm. just because you think you should get through it. What's the number one thing you wish everyone knew about sex? That it can transport you, that Beautiful. it's a trip, that is it just something you do, that it's a place you go inside yourself and with another. And stop thinking about acts and performance and think about experience. Um, and it will be a whole different ballgame. Mm. That's beautiful, Esther. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Everyone can check out your podcast, Where Should We Begin, which has a subscription now on Apple. We will put all this in the show notes, but thank you for being here, Esther. So appreciate you. It's good to connect. It's a treat. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's it for today's episode. See you on Friday. Thanks for listening to Sex with Emily. Be sure to like, subscribe, and give us a review wherever you listen to the podcast and share this with a friend or partner. You can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sex with Emily. Oh, I've been told I give really good email. So sign up at sexwithemily.com. And while you're there, check out my free guides and articles for more ways to prioritize your pleasure. If you'd like to ask me about your sex life, dating, or relationships, call my hotline, 559-TALK-SEX. That's 559-825-5739. Or go to sexwithemily.com slash askemily. Special thanks to Acast for powering the Sex with Emily podcast. Was it good for you? Email me, feedback at sexwithemily.com.